I hated jack-o'-lanterns. This is a problem since my town is known as the jack-o'-lantern capital of the United States. Every year my town is host to thousands, if not millions, of carved horrors, and it has it's become a point of pride for our Midwestern town. See, our town has been full of pumpkins since it was founded back in the 1800s. And the town was filled with glowing, grinning gourds from September till April. Most backyards had greenhouses. The public commons had three large greenhouses that grew pumpkins during the cold months, and no, no citizen had to pay for a pumpkin. I'm pretty sure it came out of our taxes. And I grew up carving, eating, and, and hating pumpkins with a red-hot fury. As a child, the glowing gourds had frightened me. My parents were never sure why, but I was terrified of them. Till I was seven, I refused to even carve one. And I remember getting into trouble several times for pushing them off our front porch. Never stopped a new one from appearing where the old one had been and a stern talking to about wasting pumpkins. Pumpkins were a hot commodity in my town, not something to be squandered. By the time I was 17, my fear had turned into a deep hatred. We were sitting on the commons, a big green expanse near the city hall that acted as a sort of park where I got the idea. Hey, why don't we pull a prank on Halloween? You know, like a, like a big prank. Chris looked up, cigarette smoke curling across his face, while Kevin leaned over his handlebars and stared stupidly at me. What kind of prank? Asked Chris, smoke curling from his lips. Chris was your typical greasy teenager troublemaker. Leather jacket, ripped jeans, black boots, a constant need to smoke the cigarette that he usually lifted from his dad. Something big. Something that will... They will never be forgotten, I said, grinning hugely. I was watching them unload a wagon of pumpkins from the greenhouse as we loitered on the commons, wanting nothing so much as to watch them all become compost. Maybe we could, uh, maybe some soap in the fountain again, Kevin asked dumbly. Kevin was certainly not as intimidating as Chris. See, if Chris looked like a greaser, then Kevin looked like a generic Chad. Blonde hair, blue eyes, tap-out shirt, gold chain wind pants, and a lot of pictures on his phone of his well-crafted physique. Kevin and Chris had been my friends for a long time, but I mostly just used them as muscle. See, I wanted them in on this in case things went south, and something had the potential to go very wrong very quickly. No, Kevin, something a little bigger this time. I'm thinking about maybe... Maybe... Smashing some pumpkins on Halloween night. Kevin grinned. But Chris raised a pierced eyebrow at me. Are you kidding? You know how anal this town is about the damn pumpkins. We go around people's houses, smash up their jack-o'-lanterns. I'm not talking about the ones at people's houses. I want to smash all the pumpkins. The ones at the houses, the shops, and the display on the commons. The two of them looked at me in stunned silence. By morning, I don't want a single jack-o'-lantern in the whole town. Kevin grinned like a shot fox, nodding his head and raising his hand for a high five, which I gave him. Chris didn't say anything for a few seconds, but his lips were slowly creeping into a distinct, evil smile as he thought over the implications. Chris was smart, uh, probably smarter than I was. But he loved a good trick, and the idea of all the townspeople seeing their pumpkins smashed, their town pride destroyed, made him grin. We'd be legends. Uh, more than legends. We'd be infamous, he said as he raised his hand for a high five. I slapped it. Boys, I guarantee that the day after Halloween will go down in history when we're all done. Now I had no idea how right I was. We began making our plans right away. Halloween was five days from now, and we had to make sure that we could commit our prank and get away with it unscathed. Being arrested for a stunt like that would only elevate our street cred, but I was honestly a little worried about how the town would take what we were getting ready to do. As we passed through the downtown on our bikes, I saw the shops littered with pumpkins. The plaques that commemorated when the world's largest pumpkin had come through with the fair one year and the display tables of pumpkins outside the Jack-O-Lantern Museum. I thought about how vital the stupid things are in my town. We could get in real trouble for what we were about to do, so... 
So the first order of business was masks. They need to be full face masks too, Chris put in. I don't want them to see our hair or our noses and identify us somehow. Kevin laughed. Easy. My bro and I are heading to Seaver Friday night. You guys slide me some money for masks and I'll bring back some quality masks. I looked at Chris. He looked at me. This was a big ask from Kevin, a guy who still got lost on his way to school sometimes. Kevin's role in the gang was muscle. That was obvious. And trusting him with something like this was a stretch. If he got distracted when he and his bro got there, we could be out of money and not have masks for this little caper. Chris was right when he said that the full face masks would be a must, and the shops in town wouldn't have what we were looking for. Kevin noticed our looks and got a little angry. Oh, come on guys, I could do this. Do you want good masks or not? We finally decided to just give Kevin some money and take our chances. We each gave him 20 and said that he better not forget and spend it on crap. The next five days were agony. We couldn't tell anyone what we were planning to do. That would ruin the prank. But we still had to make sure that we had an alibi. Our friend Mark was having a Halloween party that night. We told them that we would be there. People would see us, they would remember that we were there, and they could sneak out at 9.30 and be back before any of the booze-soaked brains had time to miss us. I didn't sleep well that week. I was plagued with dreams. Dreams that I would stagger awake from. And then fall back into as soon as I closed my eyes. I saw myself smashing jack-o'-lantern after jack-o'-lantern. And all the while something watched me from the thick fog that surrounded everything. I could see it, but it was big. Its eyes were red. He seemed pleased by what I was doing. Now and again, I'd raise my bat and salute to the mysterious figure, and it would rear back, and it would cackle like a demon. We seemed to... We seemed to plan constantly that week. We'd use our bikes as transportation. We decided that since they could cut around with less notice than a car, and we were faster than moving on foot, we figured we'd have about an hour and a half to pull this off before the devastation was noticed and speed would be critical in the operation. We had some baseball bats in my shed that we'd planned to use and begun to map out our route. As long as Kevin got the masks, we'd be home free. He winked at us Friday afternoon as his brother came to pick him up from school. Don't forget, I reminded him. He scoffed. I got this, guys. Chris sent me a text later that night saying, Still haven't heard from Kevin. <sighs> I sighed and buried my face against the pillow. Kevin better not have flaked. Chris came over the next morning and found me in my garage. I was oiling the chain on my bike when he pulled up, preparing for the night, and he looked put out. I could guess the source of his anger. Kevin had been radio silent since yesterday at school. Not a text, not a call, nothing. He forgot. He forgot and you know it, Chris said. We don't know that, I said, trying to remain positive. Chris could be volatile, and was prone to moodiness sometimes, and I didn't want him bailing out at the last minute. He won't return my texts, and his phone goes straight to voicemail. If he and his brother spent the night in Seaver, we could be screwed. I started to speak, but at that moment, Kevin pulled into our driveway with a paper bag under his arm and a big grin on his face. Sorry, boys, he said as he screeched to a halt. I dropped my phone in a puddle about five minutes after we got there. No, not worried, I said, as long as you got the masks. His grin threatened to cut his head in half. Oh, I got the masks. I think you'll find them very fitting, too. I reached into the bag and pulled out a ghoulish orange mask that made me grin as well. The thick plastic looked like a demented jack-o'-lantern, its gaping black mouth cut into a frightening double row of teeth, its black eyes angled with malice, and I could see a big plastic roach crawling from its nostril as I took it in. It was perfect. I couldn't believe that Kevin had picked these out. I, it would be fitting to attack their established idol with the likeness of them. Chris was grinning as he looked at his, and I could tell that all his anxiety had dissipated. Kevin, these are perfect. Tonight, we're going to make history. That night, we set off on our bikes, 
bats and masks stored in our backpacks along with the required six pack of beer to get into the party. We arrived at Mark's party around nine. The festivities already in full swing. It was your typical high school underage drinking party. Lots of people making out in the living room and collective of smoke clouds around the back or out front. People dancing around the loud music in a kitchen that was five parts wet bar, five parts buffet. Mark's parents were out of town. They always seemed to be out of town. And Mark's house was typically the place where parties happened. We stood around and sipped warm beer, keeping an eye on our watches. We didn't want to be here for too long. Just long enough to get noticed. We said hi to some people from school, played a few rounds of beer pong, and at 9.45, we slipped out and took our bike off quietly. We had planned our routes all day. Chris would take 1st through 6th Street, Kevin would take 7th through 10th, and I would take 11th through 15th. There were roughly 5 to 10 houses per street, and we would meet up downtown when we were done. If we got done early, we would start smashing pumpkins downtown and wait for the others. If the cops came, we would run, leading them away so the others could keep smashing. They would not assume that we were organized. They would think that we were holiday pranksters out for fun, and if they grabbed one of us, the other two could finish the night's work before they were the wiser. Hopefully. We split off at 10 o'clock. The front porch is dark, save for the glow of the jacks, and the trick-or-treaters mostly gone. I slipped on my mask as I came to 11th Street, grinning beneath as I freed my bat from my pack. The first gourd my bat hit exploded in a shower of orange and wet flesh. I smiled beneath the mask, smashing the other two and moving on to the next. The pumpkins were old by now, starting to rot, and my bat made quick work of them. I had finished with the street in no time, my arms burning from the effort already. I had seen people peek from their windows, but no blue and whites came to chase me. The work seemed too easy. The jack-o'-lanterns flying apart as I swung the bat, and I reveled in the feel of my anger and fear being satiated. I would look back at that feeling throughout the years, and I would feel deep shame. I wasn't challenged until 12th Street. I was getting cocky halfway through. I wasn't content to just smash the pumpkins anymore. I had started throwing them against trees, mailboxes, and houses. The man lumbered from the door, and though it was a little hard to see through the eye holes, I was pretty sure it was Mr. Basque, my English teacher. He asked me what the hell I thought I was doing as he came striding out, and on a whim, I threw the pumpkin full in his face. He fell back, crashing into an end table, and lay on the floor amidst the debris. I started to step towards him, wanting to know if he was hurt, but something pushed me on instead. A chilling little voice I have become very acquainted with over the years. To hell with him. Your work must be fulfilled. I glanced back at the man for another second before turning back to continue. By the time I finished my work, it was nearly midnight. How long had it taken? I'd, I'd been so taken by the act of destruction I'd lost track of time. I was surprised that no one else came out to challenge me and wondered how no one had called the police yet. My clothes were spattered with pumpkin, my mask now caked with dried seeds and goopy rind, but I didn't feel tired. Not the least bit. Quite the contrary, I felt an almost maniacal need to see more pumpkins felled under my bat. I mounted my bike and I rode downtown, feeling the cold breeze drive me forward. The breeze felt like oncoming winter, and, I, and it seemed to, to lend me its power. I passed the remains of many smashed jack-o'-lanterns on the way. Chris and Kevin had been busy, it would seem. Tables had been turned over. The gaping holes from the pumpkins greeted me as I rode. They had thrown them into the street. They smashed windows on the storefronts. They had scattered the guts of numerous gourds everywhere. It all seemed a little much. We hadn't agreed on this level of vandalism, but at the same time, I was emboldened by the sight of so much destruction. This was his will. His who I thought, and he would reward us for our efforts. I saw, or, or felt, I guess, the mist that was gathering over the town, and its icy fingers were making chill bumps pop out of my arms. I found myself looking for the figure from my dreams, expecting him to appear in the mist and cackle, but, but if he were there, he was staying hidden. I found Kevin and Chris on the commons. 
The police were there, and their blue and white lights were cutting through the fog almost as well as the fire was. I gawked at the blaze, speechless. They had set the greenhouse on fire. They had set a pyre and called the police to us. Must have lingered a little too long, though. Somebody pushed me suddenly, spilling me into the street, and fell on me as they wrenched my arms painfully behind my back. The fall had knocked the wind out of me, and I didn't have any strength to fight them off. When they lifted me to my feet, they shouted for me to get in the back of a squad car and stop resisting. I was walked to the standing vehicle and pushed into the back seat. I shimmied to the other side, waiting to see if my friends would escape, but what I saw was far from what I expected. Outside, Kevin and Chris were backing into the thick fog that swirled around the commons. The police were moving in, nightsticks in hand. The cop that had cuffed me moved up behind them as he yelled into his radio. He didn't seem to be reaching anyone. Because I saw him jerk his head away as it crackled and sparked on his shoulder. He cursed and pulled it off, stomping on the box as it caught fire. Looking away from his fellow officers as he tried to put it out. This is why he didn't notice the figure when I came out of the fog. I saw his red eyes first. Glowing from high in the fog as he came up behind my friends. He was tall, nearly eight feet, and I saw the two officers freeze as they noticed him. He came between my friends, and a single hoof stepping from the fog as his horse parted the mist. His armored form came next, his armor forced green as his horned helm, the color of moss, his sword shrieking like a wildcat as he drew it out. Kevin and Chris didn't even look at him. Their pumpkin heads still fixed on the officers. I heard his laugh, his biting cackle from inside the car as he charged the officers and cut both down with a single slice of his enormous sword. It sheared through their nightsticks, their ballistic vests, their flesh. The two fell to pieces on the commons as the third officer looked up in time to see the figure bearing down on him. I watched as his head bounced off the glass as the rider took it off, and when he saw me, his eyes locked. That was when I knew. He was the creature of my dreams. The voice I had heard. The winter wind that gave me strength. The green man had returned. He leapt the car and rode into town. Chris and Kevin followed mutely behind him. I pivoted in the seat, screaming for them to let me out. I kicked the door. I kicked the glass until it splintered into a cascade of spidery cracks. But they were already disappearing into the fog. They left me there the bodies. They left me there to take the blame. I kicked until my legs ached. I screamed until my throat felt like it would break. I pulled on my cuffs until my wrists bled. I struggled and I kicked like a child having a tantrum. But they still didn't come back for me. I'm in a jail cell now. No one seems to know what to do with me. They found me the next morning cuffed in a squad car with the bodies of three local officers nearby. Seventeen more deaths would be reported that night. Three fires. And too much vandalism to keep track of. Mark's property had been turned into a bloodbath. And the kids that had escaped were saying it was a guy with a sword and two guys in pumpkin masks with bats. The sheriff stood outside my cell for hours trying to get me to answer questions, but I refused to answer. But when, when he couldn't get anything out of me, he told me a story instead. There was a mural in the museum. You've probably seen it a thousand times, but never really thought much of it. Settlers that founded this place came fleeing something that they prayed they had left in the old country. That image on the mural, it's not English invaders as we sometimes pretend for the tourists. Granddad said his granddad told him stories of the green man, the spirit of winter, the one who sought sacrifice, punished those who wouldn't give him his due. I sat silently. That's why we light the jack-o'-lanterns. That's why the tradition is still here today. We light them. We might forget the demon that once haunted us. We light them because they keep him away. You left us naked in the breeze, boy. Burned our greenhouses, smashed our talismans, and now, now there'll be nothing to stop him from coming back tonight. He 
continue to sit silently. Do you see him, boy? Do you see the devil? He wrung his hands over the bars like a drowning man, treading water, but I refused to answer him. After I'd sat there for a few minutes, he left. I haven't seen him in several hours. They didn't search me very carefully when they put me in here. They missed my lighter, my wallet, even my phone. I've been writing this down for the past hour, knowing my time's limited. As the sun sets in the bars, I can see the fog gathering, and as it does, I can see faces looking into the bars. I know it's Kevin and Chris. The mask still looking grisly as they covered their faces, and I could hear the stomp of hooves behind them as he rode his horse, his horse that waits impatiently. The voice in my head is telling me that they need one more. They need a leader. The mask I've been wearing falls to the bars at my feet. It's in my other hand. The plastic feeling different somehow as I rub it between my fingers. You know, I think I'm going to put it on. The voice tells me I have work to do. The green man calls me to action. And who am I to deny him? Hey there, kids, and happy Halloween. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I wanted to tell you thank you so much for watching tonight's video or listening to tonight's episode, This October Fest, on the podcast. If you're not listening on the podcast, then you always can listen on the podcast at Spotify or just about anywhere you find a podcast. And if you're not listening on YouTube, then you can find it on YouTube or just about anywhere you find a YouTube. I just want to remind all of you that if you're on a cold autumn night and you need a warm drink, that my wife sells tea. There's tea available at etsy.com slash shop slash ivory monocle tea. All different kinds, including those themed off of creepypastas, horror icons, horror monsters, and Dungeons and Dragons. And if you order that creepypasta set with the Mr. Creepypasta's Dark and Stormy Night, the actual tea that I drink while recording these stories, uh, well, probably about 60% of the time, then you can always ask for that MCP dabbing sticker instead of the classic channel icon sticker. And I get a kick out of it every time someone asks her to do that. Also, I wanted to say thank you all of you who are supporting me on Patreon. It's patreon.com slash MrCreepyPasta. If you ever want to help support the show, keep the lights on, feed my cats and the like, you can always head over to patreon.com slash MrCreepyPasta and you can support the show there. Even $1 is greatly appreciated. And I have a very special thank you to these guys, such as Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Mr. Thud, Ken Lando Higuchi, Champinski, Nico Kayo, Tristan Pelton, Stephen Van Hus, Chance Burnett, Deanna Krauss, G. Weevil 3, The Red Oak Shield Virus, Corey Kenshin, Pothead Holmes, Rival 1, Jimbo the Hutt, Caspian, Jordan Nels, The Village Witch, Hades Nephew, Jordan Wayne Deckart, Bradley Lipe, Ann Charon, Acid System, Mike Bullock, Fooly Cooly Dude, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation, Brian Arse, Cryptic Nightmares, Shadow Morningstar, Brianna Wright, Someone You Love, Said the King 56, Bad Honey, S Man, Kiri the Sloth, Thomas Burgett, Liam Newman, Sky Harbor, Caleb Dougal, Last Blade Song, Rafael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, and Aaron Stormcrow. And another thank you to all you guys who are in the description down below. Thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you all for listening. And I hope you all have a wonderfully happy. Halloween. Sweet dreams. <laughs>